Welcome back to our discussion of early Christianity, and we're going to look at the end of the Roman Empire and then the Byzantium Empire today. You will recall that during our study of the Roman Empire, we saw that in the year 330, the Emperor Constantine moved his summer palace to the city of Byzantium in what's now Turkey and renamed it Constantine, Constantinople after him. And he used that as his uh, eastern capital while the Roman Empire was still um, headquartered in what's now Rome, Italy. And Constantinople liked the climate in Turkey better. Um, the city of Byzantium, which he renamed Constantinople, was in a very strategic location between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And to this very day, it has remained a strategic uh, location. He also liked the fact that that area of Turkey had very uh, rich farmland, which was very, very useful for growing essential wheat for the Roman Empire. Now, as we saw when we studied the Roman Empire earlier in the course, in the early 400s, the, the capital of the Roman Empire um, in what's now Italy, moved from the city of Rome to the city of Ravenna, which is just south of Venice. And there, that was remained the official capital of the Roman Empire until the Roman Empire was totally destroyed in the West, in Italy and the surrounding area, in the year 476, which as we saw before, is when the Goths from the central uh, Europe totally overran the Italian peninsula. <clears throat> Just to refresh your memory, we see here a map. Um, and you can see in purple that after the fall of the Roman Empire centered in the Italian peninsula in 476, the area in purple was the kingdom of the East Goths. It includes the entire Italian peninsula. Then it goes a little north of the Alps. And then you have to, to the west, uh, what's now Spain, the kingdom of the West Goths. And then to the north in green on the map is the kingdom of the Franks in sort of mo part of modern day France, um, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany. Now let's focus, we'll be focusing much of this class on the East Roman Empire, which is shown in green to the east of the Italian peninsula. And this is called either the East Roman Empire or the Byzantium Empire, named after the ancient word of the city of Constantinople, which of course was Byzantium. And this East Roman Empire lasted for approximately 1,000 years from the fall of the Roman Empire uh, centered in, in Italy. So we have in total that the Roman Empire, both the Western and the Eastern, lasted almost 2,000 years. <clears throat> now, Emperor Constantine, in the year 313, issued the important Edict of Milan. This was a statement from the emperor that officially ended the persecution of the Christians that had continued for three centuries. Near the end of his life, some say literally on his deathbed, Constantine uh, became a Christian. But during the last years of his life, the Emperor Constantine took many actions to favor the Christian church. In addition to officially ending the persecution of Christians, he provided subsidies to Christian churches, and this he exempted them from taxes, and he also gave the churches large grants of land. Now, this was 
not just the land to physically build the church, but many, many tens of thousands of acres of land, which the church, church could sell or rent out to people for farming. Under Constantine, he also decreed that throughout the Roman Empire, Sunday became an official holiday in the Roman Empire. And Sunday, of course, is the Christian Sabbath. For the Jews, it was Saturday, but for Christians, it became Sunday. And this is a day of memory of Jesus's resurrection, which took place according to Christian belief on Easter Sunday. Constantine also repealed all the laws in the Roman Empire that had penalized those who were not married or who had no children. Now this greatly helped the priests who were not married and clearly didn't have children and the same thing for the nuns. Then Constantine took what was considered a very bold step at the time by prohibiting husbands from legally divorcing their wives except when there was evidence of adultery on behalf of the wives. <clears throat> the Emperor Constantine also established concept of military chaplains. These were Christian bishops who were placed in Roman army units. They went and marched with the armies to minister for their spiritual needs. Constantine also in memory of Christ, prohibited the, the long-standing practice in the Roman Empire of crucifixion and eliminated that as a death penalty. The Romans still continued with a death penalty, but no longer in the form of crucifixion. And Constantine also decreed, as, as a dictator, what he said was law. He decreed that the families of slaves must be sold together to avoid separation of parents from their children. Now he did not end slavery, but he did make slavery a little less brutal by not separating the families of the children when they were slaves. And you can recall from your studies of American history that slaves in, in the southern part of the United States um, after the Civil War, said that their worst recollection of slavery was the fear that their family would be sold separately, which unfortunately happened on numerous occasions. Now, Emperor Constantine had made Christian. Now, let's look for a few minutes at some other reasons for Christianity's great success. We've already looked at the fact that in the early 4th century, Emperor Constantine ended the persecution of the church, gave subsidies, land grants to the church. And in the year 392, the Emperor Theodosius I required that all people in the Roman Empire, the vast Roman Empire, become Christian by making it the official uh, state religion. Now, as Christianity spread, most of the those who were converted to Christianity were pagans, not Jewish. Pagans, you'll recall, are people at that time who were neither Jewish nor Christian. Christianity at that time was the only religion that was both evangelical, with Christians going out and actively trying to convert others, and exclusive, exclusive in the sense that once someone converted to Christianity, they could not continue believing in other gods. Now, of course, members of the Jewish religion were exclusive in the sense they were monotheistic, believed in one God, but they were generally not evangelical. They did not have missionaries and make great efforts to convert others. Christianity believes in the immortality of the soul. And this concept was very, very appealing 
in the late part of the Roman Imperial period with invasions from the so-called barbarians from the north and many, many epidemics. So many people had no idea whether they would be alive the next day or the following week. And so they were very attracted to Christianity because uh, they thought they would hedge their bets. And, you know, if in fact it were true that um, the soul was immortal, well, better become a Christian so you could survive uh, and live in heaven. And in contrast, the many, many hundreds of Roman gods had no pleasant afterlife. The gods for the Romans, the many, many other gods that the Romans had, as in, and more generally, the gods that ancient societies had across the globe really did not focus on the afterlife, but they focused on having powerful gods who, to whom you would make sacrifices, usually spilling animal blood or offering gifts. So those gods could intervene while people were still alive and help them, either help them by providing rain when rain was needed or stopping the rain if there was flooding too much rain, hopefully trying to cure diseases. And of course, this is well before the days of modern medicine. And remember, modern medicine, as we know it, did not really start until about 150 or 160 years ago when started having the germ theory of disease. <clears throat> now, connected to this, we need to talk about the concept of miracles. The miracles were really emphasized by Christianity. Miracles in which a supernatural being, in this case for Christians, God, would help people in, and the important thing is, in their everyday life. So Christian missionaries, as well as the New Testament, emphasized miracles that would help people before they die. This would help people <clears throat> with food. And of course, in the Bible, which is the historical record, we don't have any other record of it. Christ is reported um, healing very sick people, bringing a few people back from the dead, feeding crowds of thousands with a few fish or a few loaves of bread. And the message here, the message for those hearing these stories or reading the Bible, and of course we have to remember that very few people could read at that time, so the vast majority of the people were hearing this orally, that the Christian God was better than the pagan gods. It was more useful than the, the pagan gods because the Christian God could work miracles. And now there were some miracles mentioned in the Old Testament. We discussed previously the miracle recorded in the Old Testament of God opening the Red Sea for the Hebrews to escape from Egyptian slavery. And then as the Egyptian soldiers were chasing the Hebrews, God had the Red Sea close again and drown them all. So the Old Testament has some miracles, but the New Testament has far many more miracles. And this reflects the fact that Christianity greatly emphasized how God could potentially intervene to help people right now. And so it's not just all about the afterlife. <clears throat> Christianity also placed a great emphasis on spiritual equality, equality of all members of the Christian church. <clears throat> and at this time in, in history, there was much, much more inequality than now. Now, of course, we talk about the need to have greater equality, but then no one really talked about equality. People just assumed it was the nature of things. You were poor, you were poor, end of discussion, the wealthy. Um, but in Christianity, when people started worshiping in the early years, the early centuries, there weren't really churches at first. People went into people's homes where they had chairs set up. And 
the rich and poor would sit together. The rich and poor would sit perhaps right next to each other or in the same row. And this was really revolutionary, really revolutionary. You recall when we looked at the, the uh, Colosseum in Rome, where they had the gladiator matches with 50 or 60,000 spectators. The seating was very hierarchical, and the, the wealthy, the powerful, would sit down below. And as you moved up vertically, you'd have poor and poor people, and the very poor people were near the top. And at the very top uh, were the women. We'll talk about women in just a moment. <clears throat> Great emphasis was placed at the time that Jesus was the son of a carpenter. He was not born in a palace. And this was very, very appealing to the many people who heard these, these biblical stories, um, and particularly in Rome and the other large cities <clears throat> where people had been forced out of the countryside because of, of violence or bad weather, and they really were alienated from Roman society and very open to new ideas. Christianity, both initially and generally throughout um, history to the present day, has been more popular with women than men. The wealthy women at the time very much liked what were considered very bold revolutionary ideas that in God's eyes, women were equal to men. This was totally revolutionary. The emphasis that husbands should treat their wives with consideration and for the first time, adultery or sexual relations outside of a marriage was considered a serious sin for not only women, but also men. And as I mentioned previously, men were only allowed to seek a divorce on grounds of adultery of the wife. And many of the early Christian authors, and this continues throughout the period of this course and beyond, they had female saints. <clears throat> now, looking at the slaves, and again, in the Western Roman Empire at this time, slavery continued. And in fact, slavery was found in the Eastern Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, others will study. Slavery is unfortunately not a new concept. The slaves liked the egalitarianism of Christianity, the New Testament, that everyone is equal in the eyes of gods. In practice, the slaves could see that the churches would, would collect funds to finance purchasing the freedom of slaves who were prisoners of war. And this is called manumission. When you, when you obtain the legal uh, freedom of a slave, this word is manumission. And what would happen here is um, uh, another tribe or country could come in well, I didn't really have countries. Another tribe or group of people could come in and capture prisoners of war. And those prisoners of war were generally simply made slaves. And so what churches would do is um, if those people who were captured by the enemy forces um, had been Christians, members of the church, they would collect money and buy their freedom. And many of these slaves whose freedom were bought became very, very devout Christians. In fact, some prominent bishops uh, throughout this period were freed slaves. And the church also recognized spiritual marriage between free people and slave people. And of course, this was prohibited uh, previously. Now, we saw earlier when we dis discussed the Roman Empire how during the first three centuries of Christianity, periodically Romans were, were literally thrown to the lions, lions in the Roman Colosseum and um, 
because they refused to renounce Christianity. This was, of course, before Emperor Constantine's Edict of Milan, which ended persecution. And the Romans were polytheistic. They had many gods. They insisted that everybody in the empire also be polytheistic. And when the Romans refused, excuse me, when the Christians refused to recognize the other Roman gods, uh, they were in violation of a fundamental law of the Roman Empire. And so, as we saw earlier, periodically, uh, Christians would be, would be killed and became martyrs. Well, a very famous historian uh, in recent years has said that this policy of killing Christians for their faith was somewhat counterproductive because as the, the Christians were, were taken into the Colosseum, let's say 20 or 30, and they, they put up no resistance, they knelt down, prayed, and sang songs as lions approached and then devoured them. And the people, many of the people in the audience, while perhaps screaming in delight, began to ask themselves, what kind of religion do these people have? that they're willing to continue that religion in the face of death. And as um, E.R. Dodd said, Christianity was judged to be worth living for because it was soon, because it was seen to be worth dying for by those Christians. Now let's look for a few minutes at the New Testament. It's compared to the Old Testament, it's very easy to read and understand with many, many stories. It was written first in Aramaic, in plain Greek. The first time it was really written was in plain Greek. And it was written many decades after the life of Christ because um, Christ and his apostles in that area in the Middle East of Judea did not speak or read Greek, but Aramaic. <clears throat> the New Testament was not written by well-educated aristocrats to be read by aristocrats. It was really written to be read out aloud to illiterate members of the church who could understand the stories. And we'll see later when we get to the medieval, uh, great medieval cathedrals with their stained glass windows, that those stained glass windows are scenes from the Bible, and the priests and the nuns would take illiterate uh, people through the church and explain the Bible by showing them the pictures in the windows. Now, the New Testament is full of metaphors, which are generally considered to be very effective to convey to the farmers and shepherds at the time the meaning of God's love. Again, we have to go back in our time machines 2,000 years <clears throat> and remember the vast majority of the people that, of course, did not live in suburbs. The people, um, over 90%, 95% were farmers. That Many were uh, fishers engaged in fishing, or they were shepherds uh, taking care of sheep and other animals. And a few examples are the question, why did Jesus die? Well, in the book of John, which is one of the early books of the Old Testament, it says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, for most of us, we've never planted wheat, and we have to think about this. Well, for the for people 2,000 years ago, and they would readily have understood this because they were farmers. Likewise, uh, the Gospels of John, it, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd, that should be good, not God, sorry. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And what does that mean? Well, the shepherd goes out with a flock of sheep 
And if wolves attack the sheep, the, the shepherd has a stick or something in his, or stones and is supposed to do his utmost to protect the sheep and if necessary, die. And as we saw earlier, that is why many times particularly this period, Christ was portrayed as a shepherd. <clears throat> and another reason for the rather rapid extant expansion of Christianity was the emphasis on love and make, made love the main obligation of adherence. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus says, well, you can summarize the Ten Commandments. And of course, the Ten Commandments are in the Old Testament. They were given by Moses, as you recall, we talked about earlier. They say, love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And for Christianity, that sums up the Ten uh, Commandments. In fact, if one is trying to search for a theme in all the books of the New Testament, many biblical scholars would say love is the only theme that really runs through all those books. And this sense of loving, benevolence, is not found really in the classical philosophies. Much of the classic ethic was justice, particularly in the Old Testament. There, was, there were stories of love, but it was mainly justice. And therefore, for people, Christianity came to represent sort of a big family. They provided economic support when you were sick, if you were taken slave, and emotional support. Very, very important at a time when there was certainly no social safety net afforded by um, the government. Wealth was shared with the poor. Of course, this is true in other religions, as we saw before, for Muslims, there's actually one of the, the pillars of the Islamic religion is to share wealth with the poor. And at the time, there were often many plagues and ec epidemics. Uh, and Christians went out and actually helped take care of the victims of the plague. Now, they didn't really have any medicine or anything, but they would give them food and water. And people noticed that and said, what kind of people are these? When so-called barbarians would come in, attack people, take prisoners, <coughs> the Christians, nearby Christians, would get together, provide the money to buy the person's freedom. During times of famine, something we don't think of much anymore, certainly in the United States when there's simply not enough food and people are dying, food was given to those who really needed it. And Many, many people at the time commented on the fact that Christians even went out and visited the pr prisons and the miners. Now, the miners were the lowest of the low of the slaves, but Christians even went out to the mines to talk to them, to, to bring them bread, and to try and convert them to Christianity. <clears throat> and looking at some other reasons for the rather rapid spread of Christianity is that the other widespread philosophies of the time were really too ab abstract for the common person to understand. And we've already studied these in the course. Stoicism, which of course was the most prominent and widely accepted philosophy, school of philosophy in the Roman Empire, more or less it's fatalism. Neoplatonism and other philosophies were just really too abstract. Christianity, the New Testament, was based on stories of a real man who had been born on the earth, born the son of a carpenter, very humble existence. He, he'd loved, he'd suffered, and died. And so in this sense, many biblical scholars think that Jesus Christ was sort of a bridge from Plato's world of the forms. You remember that, the forms that Plato was trying to describe to the senses. Now we'll look 
briefly at the Council of Nicosia, which was held in 325. And this is only about a decade after Emperor Constantine's Edict of Milan, which you recall, um, ended the persecution of Christians. There is a short video in the module about this. And essentially, this council was to bring together different Christian groups and try and reconcile major differences. At this time, there was not a hierarchical structure within the church. There were various Christian groups in um, the Middle East and you know, sort of Western Europe, and they had some significant differences among them. Of course, now for Catholics, you have the Pope who determines such theological issues. So Emperor Constantine, in fact, convened this council. And the main issue was the so-called Arian controversy, where the Arians were a group of Christians who said that, yes, Jesus Christ was divine, they accept that, but he was a little less so than God because they were monotheistic and, you know, God is the father and so Jesus was sort of a secondary God. <clears throat> now, the other Christians, Christians could not accept this because they said, no, we only believe in one God. You can't have sort of a senior God and a junior God. Well, finally, everybody agreed at the Nicosia Council on the concept of the Trinity. And this is hard for many non-Christians to get their arms around. In fact, Christians also. It's the concept that God is three in one. You have God the Father, then you have Jesus Christ, the Son, and then you have the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. They're all divine and united, but it's one God, so it is monotheism. So this is the concept of the Trinity, which we will see many times to, from now on in the Course, and it's one of the central, central tenets of Christianity. Now, prominent among the early Christians was um, Augustine of Hippo. Hippo was the area, the town he was born in, in um, North Africa, near Carthage. His mother was Christian and his father was pagan. In other words, not Christian or um, Jewish. He grew up very wealthy in a palace. He was what we call today a spoiled kid. As an adolescent and early young man, he lived sort of a playboy life. He had wild parties that were the talk of the town. He would travel. And then he finally decided he would um, embrace Christianity. He gave up his wild lifestyle, style, uh, became very austere. And actually, he worked his way up in the Christ Christian church to become the bishop and a major father of the church. And perhaps the most important for us is the fact that he wrote a famous book entitled Confessions. Confessions, it's a, his autobiography, it's about his life, he wrote it. It's his journey, his spiritual journey from a life of sin to Christianity. And this was such an important book because it was really the first self-reflective -reflect book that was written. In fact, he invented the whole genre of people writing about their life, their beliefs, and, and whatnot. <clears throat> now, when the Roman Empire in the West had been defeated and Rome taken over around, around 400 excuse me, in the 400s. Uh, well, many Romans sort of wondered, well, well, what was the cause? And they blamed Christianity. They said, well, we were doing fine until you know, Emperor Constantine stopped persecuting the Christians and then Emperor Theodosius I in 392 uh, decided to make it the state religion. So it must be the Christian religion that's responsible for our fall to the Goths. Well, 
Augustine categorically rejected this, and he wrote another very influential book entitled The City of God, in which he said all human cities or civilizations, empires, must decline. None will last forever. And his book was entitled The City of God, saying only the city of God will last forever. Now, I put in green on the slide the fact that all human cities and civilizations must decline. This was quite a new thought. You'll recall that from our study of the Roman Empire, the Romans had thought that they had created the perfect civilization, that it would last forever. Likewise, we saw that the ancient Egyptians thought that they had clearly established the perfect society and culture, and that it would never end. Well, the Romans knew the Egyptian empire had ended. They, in fact, had contributed to, to the, the defeat of um, Cleopatra and Mark Anthony and the end of the Roman empire. The Romans had ended it, and now they saw their own empire ending. So, um, but by, by emphasizing, however, yes, the Egyptians, the Romans, everybody will rise and fall except the city of God, and that's eternal. And also Constantine came out and really emphasized the concept of original sin, that people are born um, in a state of sin because of Adam and Eve's uh, disobedience of God. <clears throat> he also emphasized the flawed state of humans compared to the divine God. Now, Augustine has a major, major impact on the church and uh, Protestant Reformation later, which we'll see at the tail end of the course, where Martin Luther and John Calvin, two very prominent Catholic priests or, or, or monks, um, who broke away from the Catholic Church in the beginning of the Protestant Reformation were very, very much influenced by uh, St. Augustine's ideas. We'll now turn uh, briefly to Byzantium. <clears throat> this again is Hagia Sophia, um, obviously a modern-day photograph, aerial view. And you could just see the immense proportions of it. You will notice right away the minarets, the prayer towers, because as we'll see in a few minutes when uh, Constantinople was taken over by the uh, by Turkish conquerors, uh, excuse me, Muslim conquerors, they converted the large church into a Muslim mosque. Rather than tear it down, it was a beautiful, elaborate building. They converted it to a mosque. And of course, all the mosques had minarets, as we saw in our earlier study of Islamic religion. Now you can look at it, you can see the massive thick walls. You can see the huge dome in the center. That dome is modeled on the Pantheon in Rome, which we saw earlier. But this dome is greatly improved because you'll notice all around the Rome, the dome, rather, the many small windows to allow light to come in. And we'll see an interior view of that on the next slide. Now here we see the same church, an interior view, and you can see the majestic dome and all the windows going around, uh, allowing the light to come in. And we'll talk in a minute about a major development in architecture that allowed so many windows yet still structurally could support a very huge and heavy dome. And you will notice in contrast to the Pantheon in Rome, there is no oculus or open area at the top. Uh, rather the light comes through those many, many windows around the, the dome. And you can just see how huge this church is. Again, it's later converted to a mosque, and I'll talk about that in a minute. 
Uh, that explains why you can see those large round uh, signs with um, with uh, writing from the Quran in Arabic, uh, which happened later. But just to get an idea of the dimensions of it, if you look down on the floor, uh, those are people standing down there. You can see the people. You can barely see them. You have to squint to see them. And that, I think, puts in perspective how large this magnificent building is. And what it does is it has the dome. It's also built in the shape of a basilica. You recall, basilica was a standard Roman building design for large buildings. And coincidentally, it looks like a cross. It wasn't built for religious purposes at the, at the first basilicas. But when they built the church, they decided to use the basilica design because it provided the most interior space and was also a Christian uh, belief thing. thing. Now, the Roman pantheon, we, we saw the dome rested on a big circular drum, which meant it couldn't be really open. The major architectural advancement in the Byzantium Empire was to use what are called pendatives of concrete to carry that weight on the piers. And that's how you have those 40 windows at the bottom of the drum. On the next slide, there is a drawing of this architectural concept of a pendative. There it is. You can see how it uses arches and sort of groin, groin arches. And the pendative is that brownish area, which is carrying that tremendous weight down into the pillars. Now, light was important, not just physically to see in the days before electricity, but it's also light is the symbol of divine wisdom. We saw that Plato, and it's throughout the New Testament. And so when in the church, believers would believe that this is the actual light of God. <clears throat> now, I mentioned previously, at the beginning of this lecture, that in the year 402, the capital of the Western Roman Empire moved from Rome to Ravenna, which is just south of Venice. And that remained the capital of the Western Roman Empire until it fell um, around 476. <clears throat> at this point, we want to look at some of the architecture there. And what we're going to see is a lot of influence of Byzantium art. Here we see in a mausoleum of Galatia Placida. And don't worry about the name, where it is. But you see, these are mosaics, many, many thousands of mosaics glued to the wall, small stones, bits of colored stone and glass glued to the wall. And this is portraying Christ as the Good Shepherd. We see Christ dressed in humble clothing, wearing sandals, has a halo around his head, a golden halo, and the color gold is the influence of Byzantium art. And we'll see the sheep, which represent Christians and Christ taking care of the Christians. And of course here, carrying the cross. Here we see the baptistry in Ravenna. The baptistry, we'll see this a lot later in the course, is a small building right outside the entrance to a church in which people were baptized to become Christians because non-Christians were not allowed to enter the church. So obviously, even though they're small buildings, they're built very elegantly because they want, this is a place to celebrate someone joining the Christian community. So they're not large buildings, but they're separate buildings right outside the church. And what I want to focus on here is just look at look at the ornate, intricate artwork. Every square inch has a mosaic or is painted or is carved. On the next slide, we'll see the inside of the dome of this same baptistry building. Again, this is the inside of the dome of the same baptistry building. There you can see a very, very famous scene from the New Testament of St. John the Baptist, John the Baptist baptizing Christ. 
and again it's very ornate and the golden color predominates. Uh, this is also very near Ravenna. This is a church from that period. I don't have to worry about the name, the church, but what you can see here are two aisles. You have the main aisle going down the middle. That's called the nave, N-A-V-E. And on, on the sides, you have aisles, right? So that lets more light in. You can see the light coming in from the windows, and you can see um, the windows on the bottom. The whole idea is to get more and more light in. But if you look at the altar at the far end, still the windows are still very small. And not really until we get to the Gothic cathedrals are we going to have the walls almost entirely of glass. Because this light is symbolizing the divine presence of Christ for Christians. Now this is a very famous church in Ravenna, Church of San Vitale. Again, there is a short video in this module on this church. I encourage you to watch it. And you can see the heavy construction of those walls, relatively small windows. And <clears throat> the architectural features that are coming out on the lower right of the photo there, that's a what's called a flying buttress. We'll see those much more when we look at Gothic cathedrals. This is a way to add strength to the, those walls. And you can see another one. There's several of them going around the building. The problem is if the walls are built too thick, uh, the lights don't have really much light coming in. Excuse me, the windows don't have much light coming in. So the idea is to distribute the weight out along that arch coming out. It's a buttress to butt up the building, and it's called a flying arch because buttress because it kind of flows out. Now in the same church we have some beautiful mosaics and there are a couple of uh, separate brief videos in the module that you should watch on these mosaics. Now this is one of the mosaics. Uh, this is the emperor who paid for the construction of the church and you'll notice in this what's most important for our purposes Heaven is gold. Heaven is the background. It's gold. This is the mosaic. You can see the many, many pieces of colored stone and glass that are cemented or glued to the, to the wall. You can also see they're getting away here, the faces from the naturalism of the Romans and the Greeks. The faces look rather flat and plain. Again, this is in the same church, and we see up at the top Jesus Christ, and on both sides he has archangels, Michael and Gabriel. These are like the most senior angels. And we see on the far right the bishop offering Jesus a model of the church. Again, notice the bright gold. These are actually pieces of gold pounded very thin, and glued to the wall. And they're glued at slight angles. So the light that comes in, and of course they had candles, it would it would make them shimmer. And it's absolutely amazing to see in real life. And they chose gold because gold, of course, is a precious um, metal. It's also very malleable. It's very, very easy to work with. And that's why, of course, jewelers love working with gold. I have read that you can take a piece of pure gold the size of a ping pong ball or a golf ball and a skilled goldsmith can take that piece of gold the size of a golf ball or ping pong ball and hammer it out to be the size of a football field. It's incredible. The size of a football field with no holes in it. It would be so thin and that's what's called gold leaf. And that's what they did, and they cut that so-called gold leaf up into little bits and glued them to the wall. And they purposely glued them at slight angles, so when you'd walk by, the light would reflect off and it would shimmer. This is characteristic of Byzant Byzantine art from Byzantium. Now you can see the three windows on the left and the right 
our famous mosaics. We already looked at the one on the left, which was uh, the emperor. Now we'll look at, excuse me, we're now going to look at the one on the left, and then we'll look at the one on the right as the emperor, and then the emperor's wife. So here we have the emperor Justinian, and on the emperor's, on, on our right, are the clergy. These are members of the church, priests and monks. And on our left of the emperor Justinian, are so-called laity, lay people in the church, are members of the church who aren't uh, religious themselves. They're not monks or nuns or something like that. And then the far left, we have some soldiers, and we see those soldiers carrying a cross, excuse me, not a cross, a shield. And on the shield, we have the first two letters in Greek of the name Christ, Chiro. And of course, the emperor Justinian built this church, and so he wants himself portrayed in a mosaic. Now to the right of the window, we have the other mosaic I pointed out. This is the Empress Theodora, who's Justinian's wife, and you can see her there bedecked in jewels. You can see um, the wealthy women to the right, and uh, she has a gold coin she's giving to the church. Again, notice lack of realism. People's faces don't really have many contours, not very three-dimensional. And you'll also notice their feet are not in natural positions. They're just sort of painted in, not painted in, but added in. Now, if we leave Italy, we're going to go <coughs> back to the Middle East. This is at the base of Mount Sinai. Uh, this is a monastery, St. Catherine's Monastery. And we'll talk a lot more about monasteries when we get to the Middle Ages. Monastery is where monks live. Usually often in seclusion or helping people in the local community. And you can see this is quite a barren, isolated area. <coughs> Excuse me. Mount Sinai is where, in the Old Testament, God appeared to Moses as a burning bush. And when Moses approached the burning bush, God, according to the Old Testament, gave Moses the law, the Ten Commandments, which Moses then took back to the Hebrew people. Now, this monastery was built by the Emperor Justinian. It's been extremely well preserved because of the very dry weather there. It's um, <clears throat> similar to how we saw buildings were preserved in ancient uh, Egypt. And it was so isolated, so people, you know, bandits and thieves weren't going by to, to steal things. It was just so isolated. And what we find in this monastery was the oldest book written in Greek of the New Testament. It's called a codex. A codex, uh, we saw that word before when we were looking at the Mayas. The, a codex is essentially a book which is not bound. It's just the pages together. We also see in this church and many icons. Now, an icon means image in Greek. And the purpose of the icon is not to decorate the church or didactic. Didactic means teaching. It's not to teach people a Bible story. It's rather a window into the world for, of the sacred for Orthodox Christians the Orthodox Christians who lived in that area, Greek Orthodox Christians, would speak to the icons. And so they can speak to them and through them to God. And on the next slide, we have an example of an icon. You see the icon here. It's full frontal view. You just see the person. It's not particularly decorative. It's, um, you might say, rather boring. I'm sure if you saw this in a museum, you'd like walk by and wouldn't give it a second glance. But people didn't go to look at it to marvel at its decorative aspect, but rather to speak through this person to Christ. 
to God. And so <clears throat> we get the word we use now, icon, iconic, something is iconic. And in, we use that quite often in everyday speech. And that means something is representative. It's an image. So such and such a photo is iconic of something. And this is uh, where we get the word. <clears throat> now, Byzantium art had a great impact on Italian art, which we'll study in some depth later in the course. And of course, we'll look at the, um, the Renaissance in Italy. And we'll, we'll see a lot of the in Venice. We'll have a few slides here to, to look at Venice. Venice in northern Italy, just to the north of Ravenna, um, was a trading city. In fact, um, it became the wealthiest city in Europe. This is a time before they had countries, nation states as we know them. And it was a city state. It had a huge merchant fleet. It controlled the trade through the Caribbean, excuse me, through the Mediterranean Ocean. Sorry, wrong ocean there. Through the Mediterranean Ocean and thereby controlled all the trade to China. And you may remember from um, your high school course of world history that one reason the king and queen of Spain paid for Christopher Columbus to sail across the Atlantic Ocean westward um, was to find a new route to China because the, um, the Venetians controlled the Mediterranean and the, Spain, the Spanish could not trade with the uh, Chinese. So Venice was a very, very important city. And we'll look briefly now at the major church or basilica there. This is the classic view of Venice. We could call it now, we have a new word, the iconic view of Venice, right? I mean, this is the view of Venice, which probably 99% of the adults in the United States, if shown this photograph, would immediately say Venice, Italy. Now you can, if you didn't know that before. This is the main square, always thronging with tourists. And in the background, we have the Basilica of San Marcos. Um, We'll talk more about Venice later in the course. This is a closer view of um, the Basilica. Again, you can see the tourists and the birds everywhere when you go there. If you go there with children, the children always buy little bags of bird seed and hold it out. And the birds are so tame, they will literally land on your hand, on top of your camera, on top of your head. So. Many, many tourists take photographs of themselves. Uh, you know, selfies or photos of friends, literally with birds on their heads and their you know, cameras and all, with beautiful St. Marcos in the background. This is a very Byzantium church. You can see on the outside the gold mosaics. We have a close-up in a moment, and then we'll go inside. And the dome-shaped um, towers they look like onions. This is one of the mosaics on the outside. You can see the actual gold leaf that has been cemented in the background. And that, as you walk, it shimmers, and that's to represent heaven. Now, this is the inside. Again, classic Byzantium in terms of gold. Throughout the background, actual gold leaf. It's not... You look at the figures and all, we've gotten away from the realism of the um, ancient Greeks and the Romans. We don't have much three-dimensional here. We'll get back to it a little later in the course. But during this period, the emphasis is not on producing people who look particularly natural, but rather to represent the theme. <coughs> and the next slide is... Um, inside the same church in Venice, the Basilica of San Marcos. This is one of the domes inside. There are many domes. And again, you can see Jesus in the center. And the important thing is, for our purposes, you can see the gold background. This is actual gold. And in contrast to a thousand years ago, obviously they have bright electric lights now. 
And when you walk through as a tourist, they have the lights in various directions. And as you walk, your the gold looks like it's actually sh shimmering. It's a bit like if you go into a jewelry store. Uh, next time you're in the mall, you can go to go to a jewelry store and walk by the diamonds. You know, particularly the engagement rings where they have you know large diamonds, where they cut the diamond, the faces of the diamond at different angles. And you look up above you, you'll see many little spotlights in the ceiling. And as you move, move slowly, the diamonds will almost sparkle. They'll just sparkle. Well, they're doing that to sell the diamonds, and they are beautiful, and they sparkle, and they cost a lot, obviously. But here, what they've done is they've done the same thing with gold. And anyone walking in there, even in the days when these were built with candles, but they had many candles in there, and the lights and just slight movement of your head and the background would shimmer. You would think that you were in heaven. That was the idea. And the last slide, <clears throat> the word Byzantine today means something that is apart from referring to the Byzantium Empire, but it's something that's excessively complicated. Just remember in Byzantium art, Every square inch is decorated, decorated with elaborate carvings, particularly gold leaf, or it's very, very decorated, almost for modern taste too much. And a very common example of the word Byzantium, people will refer to the federal tax regulations or code, which hard to believe is 75,000 pages. I just looked at that on Google to check the figure, and it's 75,000 pages, the entire tax code. And if someone asked you what was an example of the word Byzantine, you could say the federal tax code. It's so complicated. Okay, well, thank you very much.